Juliet, thank you very much. And also thank you to Market Live and the team that has put on this fantastic uh, conference. Delighted to be here. Delighted to count myself among you. Such a pleasure to meet you and speak with so many. Um, I'm hopeful that I belong as part of this group. Um, I like to think of myself as an insurance innovator. Um, I led technology strategy and innovation for Allstate. Um, I led Booz & Company's US insurance consulting practice for a number of years. I led KPMG's global insurance strategy practice. And in that light, I've worked with companies around the globe really for decades to help them digitize sales, service, and claims, and work in telematics, and even use drones and satellites and AI to better predict risks and price for the risks and all of that. And so I, I love the notion of how insurance can be and should be transformed through technology. But then, about uh, five years ago now, I stumbled across epigenetics. And I hadn't really heard of it or understood much of what it might be at that point. But let me tell you, I was so impressed with its potential to truly not just revolutionize insurance, but actually revolutionize our lives, that I decided if I don't dive completely into this, I'm gonna regret it for the rest of my life. So I have. And I now lead a company called Human Life Expectancy Inc. And we bring epigenetic testing to insurance companies with the objective, broad objective, of helping as many people as possible to live as long as possible, as soon as possible. Now you might be saying, okay, <laughs> that's a big promise. And by the way, well, what is this epigenetic stuff anyway? And why is Tom so excited about it? So I, I, I have no expectation you know a lot about this. And by the way, it is a huge thing to go from zero to you know, 100 on epigenetics within 15 minutes. Um, I, I, I wish truly that my chief genetics officer could be here. He's a guy named Raymond McCauley who leads the biotech area of Singularity University and is one of the guys who invented genetic testing. He's our chief genetics officer. Um, he could do a much better job of this and this, but I guess, you know, I'm not lucky enough to have him here and I'm, unfortunately neither are you, so you're stuck with me. So here we go. Um, so what is epigenetics? Um, you're all familiar, or many of you I'm sure are familiar with the genome. Right, it, which is the double helix structure of three billion some odd uh, base pairs that make up the code, our DNA, the code of life. And it, it, it was discovered and put in the double helix uh, by uh, Watson and Crick and you know, all that stuff, fantastic. The main things to know about DNA though, are that one, it is the same in every cell of your body and will be throughout your lifetime, except for extremely minor mutations that happen, it's the same. So it's kind of, it, 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 that's why people guard it in some sense so carefully. It's, it is the code to how you are put together. But then you might ask, well, hold it. If our DNA is the same in every cell of our bodies, why is an eye cell so much different than a bone cell, so much different from all the other cells? And the answer to that is actually epigenetics, not genetics. Our genes are there. Every cell has the, the genes to become any other cell of your body. But because of what's called an epigenetic signature, which is on the surface of the genome. So epi means on top of or on the surface of. So epigenetics, you can kind of see in this graphic here, it's um, <laughs> the informal way to think about it is it's little, thing, little pieces of gum that stick on the outside to the cytosines on our, on our, um, on our DNA. And what they do is they act to turn on, turn off, accentuate, or mute the underlying genes. So it's not what genes you have, it's which ones are turned on and turned off. And that's where it gets really, really interesting. Because what, what's been shown is that epigenetics changes dramatically. Unlike genes, genes are the same. But your epigenetics changes a lot based on your age, based on your behaviors, whether you smoke or drink or not, and exercise and meditate and all those things. And also based on your health status. Do you have various diseases? So it, it, it's just a fascinating new science. And again, let, let, me, let me give you a little bit more of a background about how it all came to be. So perhaps you'll recall that back in 2003, the first human genome was sequenced. It cost a huge amount of money, $2.7 billion. And we were all so very excited to make that happen. Of course, it's a, it's a wonderful achievement. Um, what happened though for the decade after that was actually, I'll use the word anticlimactic for many of us. I think we hoped 
and had expected that, wow, we can read the Book of Life. We're going to know everything about everyone real soon. This is going to be really exciting. But again, what kept happening was we would read people's genomes and we say, oh, you know, you have the gene for this, that, or the other thing. But the genes weren't being expressed sometimes. And that can sometimes be a good thing. For example, if you carry the gene for, for breast cancer, you would love it that that gene never becomes expressed. And so epigenetics is a very real, very visceral thing. In some sense, our bodies are even more fantastic than we thought. You know, not only do our genes evolve generation by generation with homologous combination with our mates and all of that and have our children, but our genes actually change during our lifetimes, our epigenome changes based on our behaviors. So it's something like this. Um, I don't smoke, but if I were to smoke, here's, here's kind of what would happen. So I'd smoke, and my body would essentially say to me, Tom, what did you do to yourself, right? What do you do to yourself? And it would go up and down the three billion CPGs on, on, on the epigenome and turn on and off hundreds of different genes to help me cope with the reality that I'm now smoking. Importantly, it also leaves a signature. It leaves a history of what your body has fought or is fighting. And that becomes really, really useful. So again, for the first decade, it was kind of a, from 2003 to 2013, it was kind of a, hold it, you know, gene analysis isn't really giving us what we want, or not as much as we thought. And then about 2013, the first predictor of biological age came out. It turns out that by looking at the epigenome, you can much more reliably predict how long somebody's going to live from insurance and standpoint, all-cause all mortality which is a huge deal we're going to talk more about. What's happened since 2013, though, is the number and the range of, as we call them, predictors. The number of things that you can look at the epigenome and say, oh, this is somebody that has affected or is being affected by these environmental factors, these behaviors, these diseases. The number is growing all the time. And at this point, more are added pretty much every week if you, if you watch the media. So extraordinary stuff here, <laughs> extraordinary stuff. And, and watch, because this is really just the beginning. I mean, it, there really wasn't much going on in epigenetics before 2013. It didn't really get going, um, I'll, I'll say, you know, a good head of steam until you know, just a few years ago. And so you see this blue triangle here of the number of predictors getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's going to continue to get bigger and bigger bigger, making epigenetic tests more valuable, not less. And also, it's important to note that one epigenetic test can allow you to predict for all these things. You don't have to go back and query the epigenome again to do all these other tests. Once you have the predictor, you can say, okay, I now know what the epigenome is, and I can predict this for many individuals. So that's one huge and amazing thing, that the predictors are growing dramatically. The other huge and amazing thing is the cost of the tests. My apologies for my poor PowerPointing skills, but, but what you see over there is truly an exponential. The cost has gone from 2.7 billion to the high side price for you know, low volume tests now is about $300. And by the way, there was a peer reviewed study that came out only about four weeks ago where they have found a way to reduce the cost of the testing by a factor of, wait for it, 100. So, if the things you can predict with this is getting bigger and bigger all the time, and the cost is rapidly going to zero, it's clearly inevitable that epigenetics is going to become a big part of insurance and, candidly, a big part of our lives. Don't know whether you knew that before you came in, but it's big. It's big. So it's also important to note that recently epigenetics has been proven to be a cause of aging. This is really interesting because there are a lot of things that can predict your age. I mean, there's all, there's pheno, what, what doctors call phenotypic predictors. Have you ever had cancer? Where, do you know, what's your, your, your blood sugar levels and all of that? You can predict age from those. You can also predict things from age from things such as a picture of your face. They look for how many wrinkles you have and they can predict pretty reliably how old you are from that. Or they can even tell by how quickly you get up and sit down, kind of what your age might be. But here's the point. No one is going to say that those are causal factors. They're what, what, what my data guys call correlative factors, right? It, your, your, your wrinkles correlate with your age. They don't cause your age, 
right? You, you know, you're not old because you have wrinkles. That's not the way it works. But what, we're, what we are discovering is that you are old because your epigenetic signature deteriorates over time. In, this, in essence, your cells forget who they want to be, right? They, they start thinking, okay, I'm an eye cell, but hold on, maybe I'm not quite an eye cell, and they stop doing what eye cells should, and they start doing some things they shouldn't, and suddenly you're getting older. Your hair turns gray, and you, know, you don't work as well as you used to do. So this epigenetics, again, it's, it's about as visceral and about as important as it could be. And the tests are becoming more and more valuable, and the costs are getting lower and lower all the time. One of the main applications of it is you can now tell whether you're old or young for your age. I mean, we've all had an intuitive sense by that about ourselves and about other people, but now you can actually be quantifying how much older somebody is than their age or younger than their age. And this is a game changer for life insurance and for health insurance. Because what you can do is say, all right, let's do a baseline epigenetics and come up with your biological age, and now we can put you on any number of interventions whether it's a behavioral intervention, like quitting smoking, or a health intervention, a certain medicine we give you, all those sort of, th sort of things. And we can now test to see, well, how well did those interventions do at either slowing um, or even reversing your biological age? And again, there's numerous peer-reviewed studies that show that a number of short-term in uh, interventions actually do cause reverses in biological ages for populations. And so, my goodness, you know, it didn't take the insurance innovator in me long to think, you know, there could be an insurance application here, right? And so, what are those applications? By far, the, the, the one that the companies that I'm working with are most interested in is this one of better health, identifying which interventions actually do the best job for which people of helping them to remain younger, avoid aging. Um, when you think about it, it's kind of what we've been doing in trying to stay young is rather like trying to diet without a scale, right? You do what you think you should, you know, you go on a kale diet and you go running and all that stuff, but how well are you actually doing, right? And for you, is a kale diet better or is meditation better or is running a mile better, right? There's been no quantification of this until this point, and now we can do that. So insurance companies, especially companies that are involved in changing the health of their customers, bending the mortality curve and earning money that way, rather than merely characterizing what the current risks are, are over the moon about this stuff. And related to that is the stronger customer relationships I, I've referred to briefly in, in our last presentation, where Again, rather than being a grim collector of premiums or a, a somewhat reluctant payer of claims, you're actually a partner with your customer, helping them discover, oh, given who you are and given all the people that have tried this type of intervention that are like you, this is the one for you. And it's, it's not even what would work best, it's which have worked best. So it takes into account, takes into account adoption, which is very important. But by the way, um, not for nothing, better risk pricing is huge. As I mentioned, knowing how long somebody can live much more precisely is worth literally billions in profit pools across insurance companies. The process, the uh, penultimate box there, is also much more simple. So medical underwriting costs on the order of $400 for the average insurance policy. Well, as I've said, epigenetic testing currently is about $300 at most, and very soon it'll be $100 and less than that. And so there are companies, for example, in India, where the middle class is rising quickly and, and life insurance is rising, but they don't have a nationwide network of phlebotomists. And so what they, what they are using is epigenetic testing for that in their pricing. And then finally, reduced fraud. You can tell much more reliably how long, whether somebody is a smoker or not, or whether they're a drinker or not. So look, we really believe that the adoption of epigenetic tests in the insurance industry is inevitable. Those that lead will be first to get all these benefits. Insurers are now piloting epigenetic testing um, in places around the globe. And one of the reasons, I'm, again, I'm sitting here is it's a little bit more slow here in the US than it is elsewhere. And I sure would love to be part of making it happen here in this country. 
And again, we, we are uniquely qualified as a partner to deliver those insights. So that's who I am, that's who we are, that's what epigenetics is. If you're interested more, um, we, we actually also host the Human Life Expectancy channel on, on YouTube. Here's some great videos on epigenetic and genetic testing. And there's my uh, chief genetics officer, Raymond McCauley. Um, listen as you will. Been a pleasure sharing some time with you and meeting so many of you. Um, this transformation is going to take people and it's gonna take partnerships. And if any of you um, think that you might be those people and want to be part of those partnerships, we'd love to talk. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. really of course. Thank you. Mm -hmm.